All right, so kind of a, a big overview of Joshua chapter 18. Essentially, what we deal with for the majority of the passage is, again, dealing with the tribe of, uh, you know, one of the tribes getting their land kind of divvied up to them, and this is the tribe of Benjamin. But what we see that's kind of interesting here is that they've already fought all the wars, and the land is at rest, but there's still seven tribes that haven't actually gone and like gone into their land and just settled in there and, and kind of taken over their territory. Um, and, and he's just kind of like, what are you guys doing? Like, why are you so slack? And um, so th th that this is, and this is basically essentially what has happened as a big overview of chapter 18. But we're going to dig into, there's a few things I want to go into more detail on because I think it's worth going into detail on through this chapter. And we're going to start here in verse number one. The Bible says, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. And the land was subdued before them. And we're going to study a little bit about Shiloh. Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 49. Shiloh is just a location here, what it's referring to. And this is the location where the tabernacle is actually kind of semi-permanently staged. If you remember when the children of Israel were, had, had been led out of Egypt by Moses, they crossed the Red Sea, they, they, they were in the wilderness, and Moses went up to Mount Sinai, he received the Ten Commandments, and he received all these commandments from the Lord. Right. And that was that time during that time is when they built the tabernacle. They built the Ark of the Covenant. They put inside the Ark of the Covenant. They put the, the Ten Commandments in there on the tables of stone. They put Aaron's rod that budded. They had put some manna in the Ark of the Covenant. You know, they had these things that they had kept in the Ark of the Covenant. And all of that was supposed to go with the tabernacle. God had appointed that the Levites were going to be the ones that had the charge of over the tabernacle so because the tabernacle was literally just a big tent i mean it had poles it had coverings it had curtains it had you know all this stuff the way they built it it was a big tent and it was designed to be mobile god's intention with his tabernacle was not just to have only one location where the name of the lord could be named just forever permanently like, um, it wasn't meant to be some Mecca, right? Where you, everyone has to make this pilgrimage to go to this one place. Because if people turn against the Lord, he can always just move somewhere else. And, and that's kind of the concept that God has of just, hey, you know, whoever is going to serve me, whoever is going to be my people, then that's where I'm going to want my name to be. And if these people reject me, then we can, we can pack up this tent and move it somewhere else. But, and it's been in a few locations just in general throughout history, but this is kind of the primary location. So after wandering in the wilderness, they, you know, the land's finally at rest. They've, they've won their battles. They still haven't inherited everything yet and gone out and done all that work. But they're, they're pretty much settled in and they established the tabernacle and God says he wants it to be at Shiloh. So they're in Shiloh. Now, Shiloh carries more meaning than just, um, than just that location, but it goes hand in hand. And we're going to see in Genesis 49 that Shiloh is actually a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 10. This is when the, uh, the children of Israel are being blessed. And this is specifically for the tribe of Judah. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Because as we know, Jesus Christ was born of the tribe of Judah in his physical lineage. He goes all the way back through the tribe of Judah. So this blessing that's given to Judah here about the scepters, you know, a scepter is what a ruler reigns with, right? It's, a, it's the staff that a, a ruler will hold, just showing the symbolism of them being king. So the Bible is saying that Judah is, you know, the scepter shall not depart. Basically, the kingly line is not going to depart from the house of Judah. And he says, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. So that's when things are going to change. It's when Shiloh comes, then there's going to be a change. And then there's no longer going to be that king through the Judaic line, if you will, um, because Shiloh is going to end all that. And it says, And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. 
binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. And this is just, you, we can go through and look at all the various references, but I think it's pretty obvious it's talking about Jesus Christ. I'm not going to take the time to go into Revelation and go into other places that describe Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, and all these symbolic references here about his garments being washed in wine, just, you know, symbolic of his blood. And um, this is very clearly talking about Jesus Christ, and it's referring to him as Shiloh. Shiloh is the, the literal place where the tabernacle is set up, the place where God chose to have his name there. It's also a, a reference of Jesus Christ to come. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 78. We're going to see another reference to Shiloh. I like doing these Bible studies because sometimes these, these points that we make, they're not necessarily big enough to like make an entire sermon out of, like on a Sunday morning to come and just preach on Shiloh. Not saying you couldn't do it. But this provides a really good opportunity to dig a little bit deeper, especially when you see things like this popping up more than once when you're reading your Bible. And we could kind of connect, take the time to connect the dots and, and go and see all these various references and just hopefully get a much fuller understanding of what's being taught in all of these passages when you can tie every, all the events together and all the places of what, what's actually happening. So just knowing that Jesus Christ is being referred to as Shiloh and then that also being that first dwelling place for the tabernacle. Now that dwelling place for the tabernacle lasted basically until the reign of, uh, of Samuel. So we're reading in the book of Joshua, right? Moses was kind of like the first judge of Israel that led the people out. And then we have Joshua was a judge of Israel. And then we follow the book of Joshua with the book of Judges, which is his whole time frame where there was just various judges. There wasn't a king over all of Israel. They had judges that, that God would raise up to lead the people. So for that whole time, you have the tabernacle in Shiloh. But then when, when Samuel kind of comes on the scene with Eli, there's this, this battle against the Philistines that, they, that the children of Israel end up losing. And they take, you know, they, they bring, they're, they're already afraid and they don't want to do this fight. And they're like, let's bring the tabernacle, or I mean, not the tabernacle, the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, right? They're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant as like their lucky charm, their rabbit's foot, right? Because they think that if we just have this box here, then we're going to win because they've, they've lowered God to just be like in some, some object already in their hearts to think that this is just going to win our, our, our battle here. And it got them all motivated and it got the other side scared, but then they still lost. Why? Because their hearts weren't with it. They weren't, they weren't with, right with God. No box, no man-made object is, you know, God's not an idol. The power of God doesn't come through these, these physical things, these physical objects. So they, so they lose that battle, and then the, uh, the ark is taken by the Philistines, but then the Philistines are plagued. They get these, these, these emeralds, and they get these diseases that, like, they are plagued by having it. So, like, we, we don't want this anymore. So let's just, you know, at first they're saying, well, is this a coincidence or not? And they're like, this isn't a coincidence. So they send it off. I'm not going to go through the whole story. You can read it in, um, in 1 Samuel, in the, in the first few chapters. It goes over this. But... Um, they send it back, and then it, it ends up in, uh, I think, Gilead. I forget exactly where it ends up. But there's a few places then at, at that time, and God starts blessing wherever the Ark of the Covenant is. But from that point, kind of going forward, it's no longer in Shiloh. And then Solomon, of course, ends up building the temple, and that's built in Jerusalem. And that is where then um, you know, the tabernacle is kind of replaced, and God's house as it were, is, is created there. So, um, anyhow, Psalm 78, did you get there? All right, Psalm 78, let's look at verse number 58. Psalm 78 goes, does a, a lot of history of events of the children of Israel. So we're going to jump in here at 58. The Bible says, For they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel. It means he hated Israel because they were making him angry by setting up these false gods and these altars of false gods and they're sacrificing in high places and they're making God jealous with their graven images and God gets angry. So he gets so angry, he says, here, he abhorred them. He hates them. 
And because of that, verse 60 says, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among men, and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. So that story I was just telling you about, you know, the, the Ark of the Covenant being taken and everything. God, of course, let that happen. And what a, what a huge loss. When you consider what the tabernacle represented, what it was for the people living at that time, God, you know, the, the Bible describes it here is that the tent which he placed among men. This is like God's house, God, and this is what was designed by God, and it's, it's patterned after the heavenly things, the heavenly tabernacle, the heavenly mercy seat, everything that was built and that was given unto Moses to, to build on this earth was patterned after the heavenly. And how, what a shame to have something so precious that was actually on this earth among men where God's literal presence was. I mean, how many times we read about the glory of the Lord filling the tabernacle? And glory means as a great light. So when there's something as a glory, there's a glory of this light. Imagine seeing this tent in the tabernacle and just light shining through it and around it because God's presence is in the tabernacle. That's what they had. I mean, that's awesome. That's cool. I, I would love to have a tabernacle around today to go and just be like, it's, it's a special place. But they forsook that. They got, it got old. They got used to it. They started looking at what do these other people do? What do the people of the land do? Who do they were? Oh, I kind of like that. Oh, they don't have as many rules or whatever. whatever. Whatever their wicked heart was leading them away with and deceiving them with, they no longer wanted to serve the Lord. They start serving these other idols and God says, okay, fine, that's enough. And he allows for his, his glory and his, uh, he says, delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. Verse number 62, he gave his people over also unto the sword and was wroth with his inheritance. The fire consumed their young men, and their maidens were not given to marriage. Their priests fell by the sword, and their widows made no lamentation. So they're under a curse. Verse number 65, Then the Lord awaked as one out of sleep, and like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine, and he smote his enemies in the hinder parts. He put them to a perpetual reproach. Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph, and chose not the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which he loved. And he built his sanctuary like high palaces, like the earth, which he hath established forever. So now this is talking about him coming back and the temple being built and saying he didn't choose, you know, the, the tribe of Joseph with Ephraim or Manasseh, those big tribes. He said, nope, I chose Judah. And that's where he decided to put his name in, uh, in the Mount Zion. Verse 70, it says, And he chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. And then it goes on and on. Um, but that's just a reference again to Shiloh being taken and removed and then the uh, establishment of Zion. Turn, if you would, to Jer Jeremiah chapter 26. We're going to look at uh, one more reference to this in Jeremiah chapter 26. Of course, the book of Jeremiah deals with the, kind of the last days of the children of Israel before they're taken into captivity by Babylon. And th this whole time frame from Josiah up until the, the carrying away captive and then all the way through, you know, basically, you know, kind of ending when they've already all been taken captive and Jeremiah is free. But um, let's read this in, in chapter 26. The Bible says, verse number one, in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command thee to speak unto them, diminish not a word. 
If so be, they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. So, in this commandment stands, this commandment stands today. This is what God wants to be done by the men of God, by the preachers. Let's read that again in verse number two. Thus saith the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house. Now that's talking about the temple, but today you might as well just call it the church, the church of the living God. Stand in the, stand in the church and speak unto all the cities. This is unto all the cities of Judah, but this would just be, hey, to speak unto all the cities which come to worship in the Lord's house. All the words that I command thee to speak unto them, diminish not a word. Preachers today need to be heeding this, what, this commandment that God gave to Jeremiah. Hey, don't hold anything back. Don't diminish a word. Everything that the word of the Lord says is what you need to be standing and preaching in the Lord's house. It's God's house. That's why it should be His words that are being preached. And all of them. We're not withholding God's words. We're going to preach all of God's word. And the reason being, it says, if so be, they will hearken, which means they're going to listen. They're going to hear. And turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil, which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. God doesn't want to have to come down hard on his people on his children. That's why we have hard preaching. That's why we believe that church is a place to hear about sins just being railed against and that all the counsel of God is going to be preached. Everything that God abhors, everything that God hates, all the stuff that might make you feel uncomfortable in your chair, it's all going to be preached to give you the opportunity to repent to get right with God so that God doesn't have to come down hard on you. And so that God can show his tender mercies and his loving kindness when you turn unto him with your whole heart. Verse number four, And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, If ye will not hearken to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened, then will I make this house like Shiloh and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. So he's saying, if you don't listen, this already happened at Shiloh. Shiloh was made a desolation. Now, Shiloh wasn't destroyed, right? No one came in and destroyed the land or anything like that. It was still inhabited. But what happened was the glory of the Lord departed from Shiloh. When, when the tabernacle or when the, um, the Ark of the Covenant was stolen and taken captive and everything else, Shiloh ended up being basically just a regular old place. It was no longer a place where, where God's name was and that, that was established for the Lord. And he's saying, hey, here's my commandments. If you're going to follow me, follow me. And if not, then this is going to be just, just like what happened to Shiloh is going to happen here. It's going to happen to you. And it says in verse number um, seven, so the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him saying, thou shalt surely die. Boy, am I glad that in this house, <laughs> I don't have people coming up to me and saying, you're going to die. We hate what you're saying. We're going to put you to death. But you know what? Isn't that just the reaction that so many people have when they hear the word of God? They want to that they killed Jesus. And see, this is why you can, don't ever let the lamestream Christians who want to tell you, oh, you just have to be loving and you can't, you know, don't offend people and don't ever say anything that might turn somebody away. That's not how God operates. He says, you tell them everything. Amen. You tell them everything. Because if you don't, first of all, you're not giving them an opportunity to know the truth and to turn from their evil way. But he says, secondly, you know, you just do this because that's what I'm telling you to do. And Jesus did it. Jeremiah did it. 
both people, the people wanted to kill for preaching the word of God. You're not always going to get a warm, fuzzy reaction when someone hears the word of the Lord preached. But that's on them. Our job is to just preach the word. Do what God said. Verse number, let's keep reading here. Verse number um, nine. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. See, what they didn't like is, oh, why is it all this negative preaching? What do you mean this is going to be desolate? Why don't you preach that we're awesome and we're going to win? And, you know, why don't you motivate us a little bit and edify us a little bit instead of, you know, bringing all this, all this down, all this bad negative preaching? We don't want to hear that. Verse number 10, when the princes of Judah heard these things, then they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and all the people, saying, This man is worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against this city, as ye have heard with your ears. I don't think we're getting too far from this. They're saying that this guy is worthy to be put to death because of what he said. And you look at the, the not just the political culture, but just the culture in general, and, and the amount of animosity being spewed out towards people who, who stand for any kind of righteousness What's happening these days? It's not to the point of putting people to death yet, but it's, oh, this person, what, you know, they're standing up against the sodomites. Make him lose his job, right? Let's ruin his life. Let's do whatever we can to just make his life miserable and make sure he can't work anywhere and support his family. That's what's being done. Oh, they're preaching this truth from the Bible. Let's shut him down. They can't have a place to speak. Get them off social media. Make sure they don't have a platform. Make sure that nobody can hear what they have to say. That's where we're at right now. It's not going to be that far of a stretch because of the hatred and animosity that people have towards the word of the Lord. Why would we expect any different? Jeremiah's day, Jesus' day, the days of all the prophets. It's not just Jeremiah. Go through the entire Old Testament. That's why Jesus Christ himself was saying that, you know, that they that the Jews took and they killed the prophets. Which one of the prophets have you have your fathers not killed? There's always been opposition and an extreme opposition to the word of the Lord. And we just as a people, as a people of God, need to be prepared for that. Just, just understand that because that alone is going to help to strengthen you. Knowing what you're getting into, knowing that if you choose to preach the whole counsel of God and to stand on God's word and to not back down, then that is what you can face. Let's keep reading. Verse number 10, when the princes of Judah, uh, uh, verse number 12 then spake Jeremiah unto all the princes and to all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that ye have heard. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings, and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. Jeremiah stood his ground. He didn't change and apologize and say, I'm sorry, you know, God bless you. No, he said, this is a, this is a, this is a warning. You better take heed and listen. Why? Because they, they weren't his words. They were God's words. So this is what God said. You can either believe me or not, but that's what he said, and I'm not taking it back. Verse number 14, As for me, behold, I'm in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good, and meet on you. Say, so here I am. What are you going to do? Go ahead. Put me to death. I'm right here. You just do whatever you want to do, but God said, it doesn't change what God said. He's the one that pronounced it. I repeated it. Here I am. What are you going to do? Verse number 15, but know ye for certain that if you put me to death, you shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon the city and upon the inhabitants thereof. For of a truth, the Lord hath sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. See, I'm here. Do whatever you want. But, but just know this. God said all this stuff. And if you put me to death, you're just bringing innocent blood, more innocent blood upon your own heads. And then you're going to have to deal with God even more. But he didn't waver. He didn't back down. 
This is the way the man of God is supposed to be. Let's go back to uh, Joshua chapter 18. There's actually one other point that I want to make this evening. One other major point. And it, and it actually, I didn't even realize when I was preparing for this sermon how well they kind of go hand in hand. But this has to do with just what the Bible says in verse number 7 of Joshua 18 in regards to the Levites. So we've been reading about all the, the inheritance being given out to various tribes. But Levi doesn't get a physical land inheritance. And now we're going to go into a little bit more detail about why that is and what God's plan is for the Levites. Verse number 7 in Joshua 18, the Bible says, But the Levites have no part among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad and Reuben and half the tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance from Jordan. So he's, he's saying that the Levites have no part, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. Now, in Joshua 13, we also saw references to the tribe of Levi not receiving an inheritance. Joshua 13, 14 says, Only unto the tribe of Levi he gave none inheritance. The sacrifices of the Lord God of Israel made by fire are their inheritance as he said unto them, and then in verse 33 of the same chapter, but unto the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not any inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance, as he said unto them. And what I find is interesting, just in the book of Joshua alone, when it brings up the tribe of Levi not getting an inheritance, it mentions three things. It says that the sacrifices are their inheritance, the priesthood is their inheritance, and the Lord is their inheritance. They're not here to worry about the land. They're not here to worry about working the land or having this physical inheritance and building a name somewhere else and having that for their children. Their service is tied up in serving the Lord. And they're going to work for the Lord. But it's not like they're not going to get anything. Because as they minister in the Lord's house, as they perform all these sacrifices and all the duties that need to be carried out within the house of the Lord, they are going to receive. They're going to be taken care of. They will be fed. And they'll be fed well because their portion then is to partake of these sacrifices that people are sacrificing unto God. But because of their work, God takes care of those Levites in being able to eat of the sacrifices. They have the priesthood for their inheritance and they have the Lord for their inheritance. I don't know about you, but I'd much rather have the Lord as my inheritance than some piece of land in the Middle East. Now, obviously, there's a, there's a lot of symbolism and references here. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 18. And that's much of the purpose for this. There, there was a physical purpose in the sense that somebody had to do the work of the Lord. But there's also a lot more learning and wisdom that we can gain from this and application as well and ultimately what we're going to end up doing is I'm going to relate the priesthood and the priests the Levites of the Old Testament with people who serve God today and the man of God today and how you'll see that there really isn't much difference other than actually performing the sacrifices in these old diver you know there's uh, old carnal ordinances Carnal means fleshly. I mean, literally dealing with like the flesh and the blood of bulls and goats and doing all those types of things and, and physically keeping that house. There is still a job of serving the Lord today. And in both situations, God takes care of the people that serve him and rightfully so. Look at Numbers 18, verse number 20. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land. Neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part in thine inheritance among the children of Israel. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance, for their service, which they, shall, which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. So what's interesting here is we know that the tithe is the Lord's, right? God says, that belongs to me. The tenth belongs unto God. It belongs to him. But what does he do with it? God doesn't just take the tenth and just hold it and hold on to it and say, this is me. He says, well, I'm giving it to the Levites. He says, I'm giving this to you. It's mine. God deserves it, right? It belongs unto me is what he's saying, but I'm going to give it to the Levites. And, and he just turns that right back around of taking care of them. Why? Because I've hired them is basically what it is. They're going to do service for me. 
they're going to work for me. So I'm going to take this tithe that everybody else is supposed to pay and, and that belongs unto God. And he says, I'm going to give that to them. And, you know, I, I'm not going to teach a lot about tithing. We, I've already done that in the past. But the tithe belongs to the Lord. And, the, and the, the purpose of the tithe in the Old Testament really hasn't changed in the New Testament. I still fully believe that tithing is the right way to go. Is that it's still in effect that it's something that God, that still belongs unto God. That the tenth of our increase belongs unto Him. And that whenever any of us, you know, myself included, gives a tithe unto God, it belongs to God. But I also believe that the purpose and one of the main purposes of that tithe is to take care of the servants of God, the people who are putting forth their time in the ministry and the work of the Lord. So a lot of people today have this false belief and this false concept that the pastor shouldn't get paid. And they should have their own job and work their own way and do everything else. And they're no different. And you're all brothers and everything else. And that's nonsense. Now, look, I have my own job and I do pay my own way. But that's it's that's for practical purposes, because we have a small church and it needs to be done. But Lord willing, there will be a day where the church is 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 bringing in enough where I will be able to dedicate all of my time into the service of the Lord. And it only makes sense. I believe God wants his servants doing all of their focus and attention on serving him. And that's what he wanted the Levites to do. He wanted them serving him full time. And it actually worked out really well because God's plan of doing so, it only took um, one in ten out of everybody there, it only took one-tenth to support an entire tribe. And if you think about it, there were 12 tribes, right? And he's only requiring one in 10. So that even accounted for some of the, if any, if any one of the tribes or two of the tribes slacked off, they'd still be taken care of, right? Because they should be getting one, uh, um, more than just one-tenth, because there's 12, right? I mean, it, you know what I'm saying. And... Um, Let's keep reading. Uh, uh, yeah, let's see. Let's keep reading here in Numbers 18, verse number 22. Neither must the children of Israel henceforth come nigh the tabernacle of the congregation, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel they have no inheritance. But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as an heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore, I have said unto them among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 18. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy 18. We'll read through this really quickly. But it's basically going to tell us almost the same exact thing. Deuteronomy 18, verse number 1. The Bible reads, The priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. Therefore shall they have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance as he hath said unto them. And this shall be the priest's due from the people, from them that offer a sacrifice, whether it be ox or sheep. And they shall give unto the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw, the first fruit also of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and the first of the fleece of thy sheep shalt thou give him. For the Lord thy God hath chosen him out of all thy tribes to stand to minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons, forever. So notice they're not just getting the food, but they're getting the, um, the first of the fleece of the sheep. So they're able to have clothing. They're able to have basically whatever they would need to survive and to live their life and to serve God. Now turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5, because we're going to see a New Testament reference to this. And again, I'm not going to go into depth on, on the actual tithing aspect, more of just how the money is then spent and what we do with the money. Because, you know, there's, there's lots of things. There, there's a few things that the church ought to be doing with its finances. And anytime there's an abundance, you know, great, we could do even more things. And, and the church can help out more people and, do, you know, and just kind of do more stuff. But primarily... God's focus in the Old Testament was to take care of the priests, the Levites, and the fatherless and the widows. 
it's the people that needed to be taken care of were the ones that are being taken care of. And we see the same exact thing in 1 Timothy chapter 5. And we're not going to read the whole chapter. You can do this later. But it tells us how to treat other people. And it talks about, you know, caring for widows. Like, you know, you're supposed to take care of your own family first. It's the family's responsibility to take care of each other. It's the children's responsibility to take care of their parents. It's, you know, if you have a widow in your family, that's your job as a family member to take care of them. And it outlines in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that, you know, you're, the family should be taking care of them first. If they have children, if they have someone else that can take care of them, it's their job. Because we don't want to charge the church to take care of just anybody. It ought to take care of just the people that really need the taking care of. And that is people who, it says here, widows who are widows indeed. And it gives all these requirements for someone who's a widow indeed. And it's not someone who's just living, you know, a real wicked lifestyle and going out and getting drunk and wasting the money that they do have. And this is what so many people today don't understand. People will call the church. And oftentimes, even just church members don't understand, you know, what church is and, and how we give our money and how we, just, you know, how we choose to help people. You might be surprised, and we haven't gotten it here because our, our church isn't published in like phone books and stuff like that, but I, and back when I was pastoring in Prescott Valley, I get calls on a regular basis of people just calling up and saying, hey, do you, do you help with rent? Hey, do you help with food? Hey, do you help with this? Hey, do you? They've never even stepped foot in the church, but they're just calling up and just looking for free handouts. Oh, and they have, and they have these sob stories. Oh man, this happened and this happened and I just, you know, this isn't how things were being done in the New Testament. They weren't just giving out, oh, okay, you have a need, here you go. No, they said, even if you're a widow, a widow, a woman widow that can't work for herself because you know, her husband's dead, so she's left alone, even a widow is, is given a criteria of saying, okay, well, let's see. Have you washed the saints' feet? Have you, have you given yourself to prayer? Have you, are you coming to church? How about we start there? Are you even coming to church? I guarantee you they weren't just giving out a bunch of money to some widow that, that can't even show up to church. So why can't you give me money? That's not the way they had it. No, they have criteria here and saying, okay, there are some people that the church really ought to take care of. But it's, it's limited to those who can't take care of themselves. That's why it says the fatherless. I mean, if you have some orphans or whatever, you know, just some kids that they need to be taken, someone needs to take care of them. They have no family. They have no one to watch out for them. Yeah, the church can take care of those people. You have a widow who's, you know, they're godly. They're trying to serve the Lord. They're of the age. They're, you know, they're 60 years old. They're not young enough to still go out and find another husband and be provided for by someone else. Then, yeah, okay, there is another instance. Of we could, the church will take care of those people. Because primarily, still, the, the church needs to be supporting the people doing the work of the Lord. All the ministers that are actually working for God are going to be taken care of. We see here in verse number... Um, well, let's just read some of these. In verse number nine, it says, Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years. Three a score is 20, three score is 60. 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. If you have a widow like that and you're saying, Yep, let's take care of that woman, we're going to take care of that widow, the church will, will supply her need. Make sure she's fed. Make sure she's taken care of. But the younger widows refuse. So when the younger widows come and say, oh, I need money. Oh, I need to pay. The Bible says the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to, wa to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, Wandering about from house to house and not idle only, but tattlers also in busybodies speaking things which they ought not. And he goes on, I will therefore they marry. Um, I'm not going to get into all the widow thing, but jump down to verse number 17. 
Or verse number 16, if any man or woman that believe have widows, let them relieve them and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. So there you have it. Verse number 17 now is going to get into the elders. And this is talking about a pastor. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So this is talking about an elder who works hard, someone who's working hard in the, in the work of God, and it says here in, in the word and doctrine. They have good, solid doctrine. Why? Because they're studying God's word. They're studying the Bible. They're reading it, and they're doing the work. They're doing an actual labor. They're going forth. They're winning souls. They are busy in the service of the Lord. He says, Someone like that is worthy of double honor. Honor, you know, honor thy father and mother is taking care of them, supporting them when they're old. It's the same type of honor as saying double honor for the man who's really working hard. God says, hey, pay him well. Make sure that he's fully taken care of doing the work of the Lord. That's the way that's outlined in Scripture. Flip back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. The minister of the Lord, whether it be an evangelist or whether it be a, you know, a pastor, wh wh whoever is serving God ought to be given honor and ought to be taken care of. And that is completely biblical between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There is no change there. Verse number, let's hear, start reading verse number 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The Bible says, Are I only and Barnabas, Barnabas have have not we power to forbear working? So basically, Barnabas and Paul, they worked. Paul was a tent maker. He supported himself. He was going out and preaching the gospel. He was working all day, working all night, you know, doing the service of the Lord and his own work just to provide for himself because he didn't want to be chargeable, the Bible says, unto anybody. He took it upon himself to lead by example, to be a really, really hard worker, to not require anything from anyone else. He's saying, no, I'm not going to take that. But he did have the capability of doing so. It would have been right. It would have been right in God's eyes for him to be paid for what he was doing and for him to ask to receive of something of the people he was actually ministering to. That he's going and preaching the gospel to people. It would have been just fine and just right for him to collect, not to charge people for giving the gospel, but for that, for, to receive giving from them to help support him in what he's doing. Everything he's doing is free of charge. He's preaching, no matter people give or not, doesn't matter, he's gonna preach and he's gonna do the word of God and he's not withholding anything from people. However, he has the power to stop his day job or his night job or whatever, you know, whenever he was fitting in the work that he was doing in order to completely devote all of his time to serving God. But one of the things he was doing is trying to lead by example and saying, hey, you know, you think you don't have enough time to serve God? You think it, you, you have too busy of a schedule? You're too busy with work? Well, I work. I'm doing it. I'm going out soul winning. And, you know, like I said, Lord willing, I'll be able to quit my day job. But you know what? I've got a day job. I work 40 plus hours a week. I've got a family. I have to write three sermons a week. And guess what? You're going to see me out soul winning. I read my Bible. I pray. Don't tell me you don't have time. You do have time. You're just not making the time. You have time to do Bible memory. You have time to pray. You have time to go soul winning. You have time to come to church. What's important to you? And I'm probably nowhere near how busy the Apostle Paul was. I mean, he's traveling around and doing, you know, what a great example. But that's why he did it. But, but the point that he's making is saying that I can stop working at any time. Talking about his physical job, making the tents. I could stop doing that. I have the power. Barnabas and I, we can stop working. And let's keep reading here. Verse number seven. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? So he's saying, you know, when there's a war, 
when people are sending troops out, they're not all paying for themselves. They're being provided for. They're being sent. Somebody's paying for them and paying their way and actually paying them to go and fight. I mean, it's like that in the military today. Milita you know, people in the military receive a paycheck to serve the military and go do that. They're not just you know, completely self-funded and going off and, and doing this of their own you know, uh, just charity or whatever. And he says, you know, if you plant a vineyard, who doesn't eat of the fruit of your own labor? You're out there working, you're growing stuff. Of course you're going to partake and eat of, of the work that you're doing. Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? So get this. Don't let this slip by you. This is the New Testament. Jesus Christ is already risen again from the dead. This is Apostle Paul speaking, and he's referencing, well, doesn't the law just say the same exact thing? That I'm teaching you right now that I don't have to actually work because I'm preaching the gospel and I can live of the gospel because the law says so. It, it seems to me that the Apostle Paul, the same apostle that's telling us the differences between the Old and the New Testament in many places in the Bible, is telling us right here, guess what? This hasn't changed. This is still the same. Verse number nine. For it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. He's saying there, it's right there in God's law. You don't muzzle the, the ox. And he says, doth God, doth God take care for ox? And he's saying, does God really care? So you have an ox that's treading out corn. I mean, it's stamping corn. It's making cornmeal, right? Stamping the corn into powder to be used for food. So they're using an animal to do this. This is their, 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 their uh, beast of burden, their, their labor animal doing this stuff. And he's saying, well, don't, don't muzzle the ox. Let the ox that's working, that's treading out all the corn, let him eat a little bit. Let, let him, as he's stomping around on the ground, let him dip his head down and eat some of that corn that he's, that he's working and, and pressing down. That's in God's law, but he's saying, do you think God really cares that much about the ox getting to eat that food? Or saith he it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written. So he says, he says, there's no doubt about it. He's not saying it because he really, really cares that much about the ox. Because he doesn't. It's given to, for us to learn by. As an example, hey, the person doing the work, let him eat. He says that he, he that ploweth should plow in hope and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? So think about how important the spiritual things are. The work of the Lord, the spiritual thing, the gospel being preached, the word of the Lord being preached, the light being shined. What's more important than that? Is it really a big deal then because this job is being done, that the person doing that job gets some carnal things, gets a little bit of money, gets a little bit of food, gets a little bit of whatever to, to, to be able to continue doing what he's doing. He's like, is that really a big deal? Like, are, are you going to freak out about that because the, the, the servant of the Lord is actually getting paid a little bit to, to do this work? It says in verse number 12, if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Again, it's, this is a reference to people, to the Levites, serving in the temple, and that they lived of the things of the temple. As we've already read now in all these various passages in the Old Testament, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. They're saying, don't you already know these things? This is how it's always been. Even so, verse 14, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And then he goes on to say again, but I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. So you're saying, you know what? I don't want it. And that's his choice to make too, by the way. He's free to not receive that, that benefit of, of being taken care of physically. But again, like I said, he's, he's making a point. He said, I have the power to do this. 
God's given me the power to be taken care of, but I'm not going to. And I think he, did, he, he wants the reward so bad. He's like, I don't want anything here. Like, I'm just going to work and support myself and do it all. And no one can make my glory in void. And then it says in verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And he goes on and on about that. Now, um, it should be very clear and very obvious that this is the same in the New Testament, that God wants his servants, his ministers to be taken care of. The reason why I'm even going on is because there, there are some people out there that, that it's mostly comes from the house church movement, but it's, cre it's crept into Baptist churches and stuff, and especially with just the internet and people just kind of going on and seeing all this stuff. People who usually have never been in any ministry, ever been in the work of the Lord. People who show up, you know, and, and I understand this because even for myself, going to church, you have a much different mentality of going to church when all you do is show up. When you go up, when you show up to church, it's like showing up to anywhere else. If you were to go see a movie, when the, when the movie theater's open, you're going to say, of course there's going to be someone to sell me my ticket. Of course there's going to be someone you know, selling popcorn. Of course all of this stuff is going to be there. I'm going to show up. I'm going to use it. I'm going to leave. And when the church door is open, of course I'm going to go to church. Of course there's going to be a pastor there. Of course we're going to sing some songs. Of course he's going to preach a sermon unto me, and it better be a good sermon. And then I'm going to go home. And I get it. I understand treating things that way and, you know, and, and then feeling like, well, no, you, I mean, this is, you're, you're the pastor, so you've taken that job, so you, you, know, you, just, you should be doing that for me. Okay, yeah, I have taken that job. But don't then get this idea that, well, well I read my Bible, oh, I, you know, why should you get paid? You have no idea the amount of work that goes into what's done at church. No idea. Until you actually even start doing it. I see Caleb over there shaking, nodding his head. And that's because I know he's doing some work at Word of Truth Baptist Church. And he's gotten a taste of it. And even, I'm sure he testified, even, even, you know, the work that he is doing, I mean, it's not, he's not the pastor over there. He's not writing three sermons a week and, and doing everything that pastor needs to do and trying to watch over the flock and watch out for wolves and make sure everybody's needs are taken care of spiritually the best that they can and, and you know, praying for everyone and, and doing all the setup and, and everything that needs to be done and being the one responsible at the end of the day that, hey, if bills need to be paid, guess who's paying them? If something needs to be done, you know, you could delegate some jobs, but at the end of the day, you know who's responsible? The pastor's responsible. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't take this job ever because I'm wanting to get paid and like, oh man, I just want to make this money and this is going to be an easy job. No, it's never been about money. And no pastor should ever do that. And if you ever think that you might one day want to be a pastor, don't, if you're going in it for the money, it's always the wrong reason. The purpose is to serve God. And you do, because you, you're, you're going to be giving of yourself more than you're receiving, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, unless, unless you are a false prophet, unless you are a Joel Osteen, you know, then you are going to be giving more than you're receiving. And that's fine. Because we don't work for the money in this lifetime. We work for the rewards in heaven. But that being said, you still need to live. You still need to, I still need to feed my family. I still need to eat. And that's the purpose of this. Now we see, um, the reason why I think this is all interesting, we, talked, we started off talking about um, Shiloh. And we went in the passage about Jeremiah and how you know, he, did a, uh, he did what he was supposed to do. And this is who the Bible is saying, you know what, people who stand up and do that, they ought to be taken care of. The people who don't withhold from, from God's word 
of course they ought to be taken care of in that way and they're worthy of double honor. Now, um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it short there. I had one more thing to go over, but I don't think I'm going to go over that tonight. It doesn't really fit in well anymore with, uh, with the way the sermon played out. But So the rest of Joshua 18, because we kind of only went through a few verses, um, it basically is giving out, again, all, the, all the, the tribe of Benjamin, their portion and their inheritance. But I, I'm just gonna, we'll close on this verse. We'll close on verse number three. The Bible says, And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are you slack to go to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers hath given you? Now, like I said, they, they've already fought their battles. Their main battles are won. The, the, the land has been subdued before them. And they just haven't gone and just kind of just finished it up and just gone and, and inherited their land. He's saying, how long will you be slack? Why well, are you just wasting your time now? Get, get going in your business. Get into your inheritance and start, um, and start doing what God had for you to do. Go occupy your, your land and your inheritance and, and get working. And, uh, you know, we ought not to be slack in the things of God. And even when you win victories, don't stop short, right? Don't be slack in finishing the job. Here's a perfect example. Just, just one real quick, great example of this. When you go out soul winning and you finally, you know, you knock on maybe a few doors and you get someone saved. Great. That's awesome. It's a victory. It's a great win. It's exciting. Don't just stop. Don't just be like, cool, got someone saved, I'm going home now, right? Now, if you've already planned, you're going out for, for you know, a couple hours or whatever, and it just happens to be the last person you end up running into, fine, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about maybe the first door you're knocking, someone gets saved, and you're just feeling so good. All right, we got that battle won, okay, I'm going home. No, keep going. Keep going, there's a lot more work to be done. Don't be slack. Get the job done. You start doing the Bible memory. And you start memorizing some verses and then you kind of, no, no, you get busy doing something else. Don't be slack. See it all the way through. Get to the end. Finish it. Finish the course. Stay the course. Don't drop out. They'd come some, so far, the children of Israel, it's like, and it said there were seven tribes still. That's more than half. The majority just got slack. And watch out, because in church, oftentimes, when people start to become slack, the majority can end up becoming real slack and real laid back and not as zealous. Now, thank God we have a church of zealous people. There's a bunch of zealous people here today, tonight. But the, the slackness, if you will, can rub off on other people. And we need to be aware of that and make sure that we don't allow ourselves to fall into that slump and bring other people down with us. Just like um, after Jesus Christ's resurrection and, you know, the disciples were left and Peter's like, well, I'm going fishing. Who's with me, right? And then he brings a whole bunch of other people with them. And Jesus already told him, hey, you're not going to be catching fish anymore. You'll be catching men. But he fell into that slump. And then before you knew it, you got Peter, James, John. They're all out fishing. They're all out being slack and not being about the Father's business. Let's not allow that to happen to ourselves. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words. And I pray that you would please just stir up uh, all of our souls here tonight, help, help this church to grow, help us to continue to push forward and to push on and to um, be bold in, in our proclamation of your words. And God, um, we, we need your strength. We need your help. And... Um, but most importantly, Lord, help us to be able to, to spread the word as much as possible and, and give us the, the platform and the megaphone to do so, so that, that the whole world can hear. And um, help us to also be strong and to not back down as Jeremiah didn't back down, Lord. They're your words and not ours, and we just want to go and be servants of yours to, uh, to preach your word, Lord. Help us to do that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.